So, it took us most of the lifespan of the Super Nintendo to get the first Mario Kart game. However, with the N64, we are getting the game Mario Kart 64 during the launch window. So, see what we're getting additional titles is pretty slow, as we've only got three games this time, as we cover Nintendo Power number 93 for February of 1997. Our cover game for this issue is Mario Kart 64, which is putting its the issue's best foot forward. In the letters column, we have a letter writer asking for some specific import titles to be brought out for the Game Boy of the US, one of them being Pocket Monster Trainers, which we know now as Pokemon. Nintendo editorial hedges and says, oh, these games didn't get brought out for a reason, but we're going to get Pokemon either way. Only one new title in the power charts this issue, Mortal Kombat Trilogy for the N64. Though we have returned the power charts, uh, Turok on the N64, and Super Mario World 2 and Donkey Kong Country 2 for the Super NES. Getting into the meat of the issue, we're starting off with the cover game, Mario Kart 64. We have maps and notes for all four cups, along with the arenas for battle mode. With Mario Kart 64, it is truly amazing what the addition of three-dimensional terrain can do. Just adding rolling hills and with the ability to obscure upcoming, upcoming stretches of track and any obstacles left there by other racers puts a whole new spin on the game. It adds different degrees of strategy and just makes things a little bit more dynamic. On the other hand, it feels like power sliding is a lot more essential to success here with doing the power slide to build up a turbo boost and indeed accelerating by power sliding. Which means if you can't quite get a handle on power sliding, particularly in some of the more twisty curvy uh, courses, you are going to run into problems. Now, the game is enjoyable and I'm glad I played it, but I'd also say that if you're already playing Mario Kart 8 on the Switch and are enjoying that, there isn't as much incentive to go back and play Mario Kart 64 outside of curiosity. Next up, we have a preview coverage for GoldenEye 64, focusing on the weapons you can carry, the menu interface to the Q-Watch, and descriptions of each level of the game, but no strategies or maps. This is light enough that I'm going to hold off on the review until later, particularly since, at the very least, later coverage should have more stuff on, like, bonus objectives and that sort of thing. We have a peripheral article here that is an article covering a peripheral, specifically the memory card for the N64, talking about how it works and what you can do with it. As an aside, it's interesting how the way we play games has shifted, where memory cards allowed for the idea of taking a saved game or custom racer or team or playbook with you or create a wrestler, in the case of wrestling games, with you to a friend's house when playing there for this and the next console generation with the era of the GameCube and the PlayStation 2. But this goes away after that with the generation of the Wii, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360, where the focus shifted more into playing with those consoles online instead. We And we still don't quite have a way to carry game saves and that sort of thing back and forth without logging back in at a different location. So I feel like something has been lost with the disappearance of the memory card as a as a significant and high profile part of the video game playing experience. We get the conclusion of the Shadows of the Empire comic, both in the general sense of this being the last issue where it's serialized, but also in the very specific sense of the conclusion of the story. We have another preview article for Turok Dinosaur Hunter this issue, giving some more information on the weapons, game mechanics, and enemies. We also have the additional coverage of the game Shadows of the Empire this issue, focusing on challenge points, how many there are available per level, and how you earn them, and also what you get once you've earned, managed to earn all of them. Epic Center is back! In the news, Epic Center news section, we have a discussion of various games from Shoshin Kai. Some of these, like Wonder Project J, are not getting an official US release, though they are 
getting a um, getting translation patches and all that fun stuff uh, later. So if you want to import it, you can still play it in English that way. We also get some notes on various 16-bit remasters, like the 16-bit version of Dragon Quest III for the Super Nintendo, which is a very, very pretty game. Though we do have a US game release for the Super Nintendo getting featured this issue, even inside the Epic Center. Harvest Moon, the first farm life simulator, as opposed to a more general farming simulator. We got a bunch of notes on the game's structure and advice on when to do what in the game. Harvest Moon is a game that showcases its potential very early, very clearly, all from the jump. It puts you in an environment where you get to know a bunch of people in town, and puts a whole bunch of mechanics on you regarding managing your farm. It's a game that is very much about process optimization, in the same way as the, like, the Persona series from Persona 3 onward are, about managing your time, doing your chores with the best ability possible, and the time available to get the best possible farm. This, however, leads to a bit of a problem. There's not really a pause in the game. You can sort of fudge it by using the sel by um, using the select button to bring up like a clock menu and that sort of thing, and that stops time if you're not carrying something. But there's that's it. There's no sub screens to help you kind of keep track of information, and no other relevant relative menus. The game's clock effectively never stops, which means there's no real way to take a moment, catch your breath, collect yourself, and put together a plan for what you're going to do next. I definitely get how this game and its Rune Factory spinoffs led to Stardew Valley and why all of these games have gotten their appeal, but it also makes for a clear situations where later games, both in this series and this, in this genre, the farm life simulator genre, pull this off so much better because there's room significant room for improvement for making something more user-friendly, more chill, but without necessarily having the separate level of vibes of, say, something like a um, Animal Crossing, for example. Next up, we have an epic import title, uh, Marvelous, Another Treasure Island, a sort of hybrid Zelda-style adventure and slash visual novel combined, published by Nintendo even. Um, and even developed by Eiji Aonuma, who is currently responsible for the Legend of Zelda series. Sadly, due to the time when this game came out, with the focus being on the N64, this game didn't get an official U.S. release, but it has received an English translation patch if you have a Polymega or Retron 5 or other similar clone console that supports game patching that you can use to play it with, with that patch. In the Epic Strategy column, we have additional coverage on Lufia 2, focusing on side quests and some of the dungeon puzzles. In the Classified Information column, we have a whole bunch of codes for classic NFL teams in Madden 97. We also have a whole bunch of reissued games this issue because it's the start of the year and there's not a lot of new releases coming out right now. And this, in this case, it's Star Wars for the Game Boy and Super Empire Strikes Back and Super Return of the Jedi for the SNES, all of which I have previously reviewed. Our other big Super Nintendo re-release is Top Gear 300, uh, the racing game which I previously reviewed or at least tried to review before running into some emulation issues. Next up, and the last actual game we'll be reviewing this issue is King of Fighters 95. Uh, which, sort of like the Toshinden game I reviewed earlier, is a semi-super deformed or SD take on the fighting game. In this case, the Neo Geo arcade fighting game. And we have move lists in this article for all 15 playable characters. So, King of Fighters 95 is not as super deformed as, say, Samurai Showdown or Toshinden. The sprites for the characters, while still somewhat stylized, retain the general proportions of their regular counterparts, and the controls also work very similarly, though again, simplified. The graphics include little bits like, yes, my Shorani, Gynaxing, or on the less cheesecakey manner, the way the fabric on Ayori Yagami's clothing moves. Honestly, it's better graphics than the Game Boy has any right having. On the minus side, the Game Boy doesn't have enough sound channels to do both sound effects and music 
so you have to pick one or the other. I mean, occasionally, the game will have sound effects override the music for certain moves, but otherwise, the music tends to take precedence. Now, you're not going to see this version of KO KOF 95 at EVO anytime soon, but I'd watch a tournament of it. We get some expanded coverage of Mole Mania on the Game Boy this issue with an almost complete guide for the game. In Counselor's Corner, we have some info on how to create a combo, presumably actually spelled with a K, for Mortal Kombat Trilogy on the N64. No also rans in the Now Playing Calmless issue. We're kind of short on those. I may have to find an alternative for the best of the rest when we get to the end of the year of the Nintendo Power year. We'll see. And finally, of the upcoming titles of Packwatch, we have a further look at Doom 64 and the unreleased Robotech Crystal Dreams. My pick of the issue is Mario Kart 6. For my minor reservations with the game, we have better, more recent games. It's not a bad game in the slightest. In fact, if you have an N64 and are looking for fun N64 games to play with friends, Mario Kart 64 is a really solid one to go with. Now, I did enjoy King of Fighters 95 on the Game Boy a lot, but like honestly, the games we had this list issue, Mario Kart was the strongest overall, and on the multiplayer, like Mario Kart's the strongest game in that regard too. Um, even on like your like farm life simulator standpoint, while certainly Harvest Moon pioneered the genre. Later games did it better. Later games are did it in ways that are more friendly. Or just within the Harvest Moon trees. So Stardew Valley right there. Next issue, time for rock. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.